I, uh, I don't even know where to start. I don't. But I feel his presence here this morning in a mighty, mighty way. Isn't it good? Yeah. As a child, I was taught the Ten Commandments. How many learned the Ten Commandments when you were a kid? Yeah. And it was sort of like, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, and thou shalt not, right? <laughs> and what happens when you say thou shalt not? Don't all answer at once. We, we have a rebellious attitude sometimes when we have that thou shalt not in our lives. Am I right? And so as a child, I learned them. I memorized them. And as an adult, I forgot about them. Am I the only one? Certain times in my life, I would, I would forget about certain ones. So this morning, we're starting a series of the Ten Commandments, and I've got a few minutes. I'm going to try to get two in for this morning, okay? Two of them. But I think it's good to know why the Ten Commandments were put in place to begin with. What was it? that prompted God to put these commandments in place. Scripture tells us, and I, if you want to turn to Scripture, the Ten Commandments are found in Exodus chapter 20 and then in Deuteronomy. You can look it up either way, but, but we're going to go out of Exodus chapter 20, okay? So you can turn your Bibles, your iPhones, your iPads, whatever you look at your Bible with, go to Exodus chapter 20. But in Exodus, what's interesting about these commandments is Moses was invited up to Mount Sinai to get these tablets. And the first time these tablets were etched, he cut these tablets out. God, God did it, and he wrote the Ten Commandments for Moses. And he said, I want you to go down, and I want you to give them to the people. And Exodus is a very interesting book of the Bible. If you've never read it, read it. Very, very interesting. But the first time... Moses comes down off of the mountain with these Ten Commandments that God had written to him. And why, what prompted God to write these? I'll tell you. They were, the children of Israel had been in bondage in Egypt for 430 years. And inside of Egypt, there were thousands of gods that they would pray to. They actually had 29 main gods and over 2,000 subsidiary gods that they would pray to, gods of fertility, gods of, uh, of finance, gods of you name it. They would pray the, the sun god. They, they had thousands of them that they would pray to and that they believed and worshiped in. And we all know that there's only one true God, and that's the Jehovah God, the one that delivered them from bondage in the first place, right? Amen? And so he knows that they are now, they're coming out of all of this bondage. And they're coming out of a culture that it was so pagan in their belief, in their idols, and in their, in their worship to these gods, these false gods, that he had to put something in place because they were headed to Canaan. And honestly, Canaan was involved in the same thing. But the one thing that they were, I mean, yeah, it, it, We'll get to it. Exodus chapter 34, verse 28. I want to read that first before we go to Exodus 20. This is now, oh, the first time. I, the first time Moses comes down off the mountain, he had these two tablets in his hand. And you guys know the story. While he was up on the mountain, his brother Aaron was supposed to be looking over the children of Israel. And in those commandments that he had written, God had given to him. It was like, you shall know, have no other gods before me. And then the second one is, you shall not make any idols. Or a graven image, the King James says, a graven image. 
because they would make these little carvings out of stone or out of wood. I doubt it was out of wood. They don't have much wood over there. I couldn't find much wood when I was over there. Let's believe me that. It was stones and dust. But they would carve these little figures out, and then they would pray that that God would inhabit that image. And then they would pray to that image for all of their successes and all of their sicknesses and all of the things that they wanted to have accomplished. Does that make sense? That's why they weren't supposed to make any graven image. Guess what? God made an image, and he lives in us, and we are to, you get it? We're to be the ones bringing the gospel and to bring his spirit into the world. But that, that, was, that was Satan's way of mimicking what God had done for us, right? So there were supposed to be no graven images, and here comes Moses off of the mountain, and he sees, you know what he saw? Aaron had let the people build, they melted all their gold, their earrings, and they melted it down, and they made this golden calf. And they were busy dancing around it, doing crazy things that we won't mention around this altar that they had created. And they had went straight against what God's first two commandments were. And it angered Moses. And what did he do? Somebody help me out. He threw him down and broke them, right? If we can't keep it that little short span of time that I went up the mountain and came back down, then there's not worth having. I threw him down. He threw him down. But in Exodus chapter 34, verse 28, he goes back up. God invites him back up. And Moses was there with the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights without eating bread or drinking water. And he wrote on the tablets the word of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Now, this time, God had told him, take a hammer and chisel, carve out those stones that I had made the first time, and I'm going to have you write them. Because when you've got skin in the game, you're not going to get rid of it nearly as fast. You understand? He came down the first time, threw him down, and broke him. These were given to the children of Israel, and I believe what prompted God to give it to them was the relationship factor. He wants relationship with us. He wanted it with them, and he wants it with us. We tend to look at those commandments as laws and as judgment. If you don't do this, then this will happen. And I believe that those are, that, that it, they are commandments. I, I, I believe that. But throughout this series, what I want to do, and this is not original with me. I actually found this, where principles are added behind each commandment. And I believe that God so intentionally put these commands in place that when we live out our Christian life, those principles become, come before the commandment itself. You understand what I'm saying? So relationship is what God was looking for. Uh, he, he was looking for uh, people without shame and guilt. And so he put these commandments in place so that they would stay inside of the guidelines. And we all know that ultimately he sent Jesus and the price was paid, and we can live our lives without shame and guilt. But relationship is a big, big deal to God. And in my house, relationships trump everything, don't they? That's written on my little whiteboard. Relationships trump everything because that's where God, that's where he exists, is in our relationship. He redeemed, he created Adam and Eve for relationship. He redeemed the children of Israel for a relationship, and he is redeeming us for a relationship. So, Exodus chapter 20, and I'm going to go through it fairly hurriedly. Verse 1, if you're ready. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God. Right there is that relationship. He's telling them, you are my people and I'm your God. We're going to have a relationship. And these commandments are going to be put into place so that we can keep things in, tra in, in track. So who brought you out of the land of Egypt? He's already stating what he's done for them and out of the house of bondage. And later on, he goes what he's going to do for us. Right. So the first commandment is you shall have no other gods before me. And I would like to introduce the principle to that commandment is priority. 
We live our lives in now in this modern era where things are so, so busy and we so often we forget about God, right? Until something drastic happens in our life and all of a sudden we find ourselves in this broken and in a crushed place in our lives spiritually that it is only God that can get us out and that's when we remember God. How many can say amen? And God is saying, don't have any other gods before me. I want you to prioritize your life. The principle of priority is what that first commandment represents. Romans chapter 6, verse 6, you say, well, that was for them. That was for the children of Israel. That was for them. And I challenge you to Romans chapter 6, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. So see, they were slaves to Egypt. We've been slaves to sin. He redeemed them. He's redeemed us. But he wants us to keep him a number one priority. These 10 principles as we go through this this summer are only principles that I believe will help us in our depth of relationship with God. I trust that when we get done with these that we can go back and review them all and that our, our relationship with God has gotten deeper. And I will tell you this. You, all of you sitting here and me, are the only ones that can determine how deep we go with God. God can call. He can do all kinds of things. He can, he can do everything possible. But if you don't choose to put him first in your life, he won't do it. You understand? You are responsible for your deeper relationship with God. Only you. You determine the depth of your relationship with God. Exodus 20, verse, uh, verse 18. So we're going to jump. So, so the Ten Commandments are stated between verses uh, 2 through 17. So in verse 18, this is very interesting what I see in this scripture. Now all the people witnessed, right? God had been up there talking to uh, Moses and they were doing the the tablet thing. And and, and we sing that song, show me your glory. And maybe have to sing that yet today, but show me your glory. It's all about that cloud that came down and God was in it. He spoke to Moses and the whole earth started shaking. There was thunder, there was lightning. The mountain started smoking and here it is. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Verse 19, they said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And how many know when we go to talk to God ourselves, and that veil was torn, we can do that now. But when we go to talk to God ourselves, there's a lot of flesh that has to die. Am I right? There's things that God brings into our lives, at the refiner's fire that brings it up to, and and there's things that need to be changed in our lives. A lot of stuff has to die for us to be talking to God like this. And verse 20, and Moses said to the people, do not fear for God has come to test you and that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. In verse 21, so the people, somebody read that for me. (laughs) So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near. The The thick darkness where God was. It's kind of like church today. A lot of people expect to walk through the week and they expect the the preacher to go up to the mountain and get a word from God and come down Sunday mornings and give it to them. And then, you know what? We'll come back next Sunday for more, but you do it. They point to me. They point to Furman. They point to the pastor and say, you do it. Bring me what God has said. And and, And what he's saying is, you can do it. You as an individual are required to take care and maintain your personal relationship with God. But I thought it was quite interesting there in verse 21 that they stood afar off. They were scared to go talk to God because you know what? There's a lot of things that come to light when you go talk to God. A lot of things come to fruition when you come to talk to God. But Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Moses was wanting a deeper relationship with God. Do you want that? And it should be your priority. Amen? He wanted us, he wants us to worship him only. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 5 says it this way. I am the Lord, and there is no other. 
there is no God besides me. And I think that is better said than you shall have no other gods before me. Because sometimes we think, well, maybe since it says before me, uh, maybe after me, you can have something that you hold on to a little more dear. But in Isaiah, it says besides me. And I like that translation just a little bit better because you cannot have something in your life that takes a hold and takes precedence over God. Priority is the principle for rule for commandment number one. Put God first. He has required that all throughout Scripture. He required the firstborn. He required the first fruits. He required a lot of things in the Bible, and there was always first. He wanted it first. God wants to be first in your life. He's a jealous God. Matthew, uh, in Matthew, Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Seek it first. Seek it first. Priority. The second commandment that we'll cover this morning, it says pretty much the same thing I always thought. But when I studied it, I understand that it's not the same thing, and I, I, I believe I understand what God had intended when he said this. You shall not make for yourself a, cur a carved image and any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. So what he's saying is, you guys are coming from a place where they worship many, many gods. And you're going to a place where they worship many, many gods. But you, Israel, are the one that serves and worships a one holy and true God, right? And he was warning the children of Israel of the things that were coming. You're going to be tempted. You're going to be tempted to be impure in your thoughts. You're going to be tempted to go and do some of this worship the way that the pagan people are doing it and the, and the others are doing it. But I'm asking you, not to. And it was proven right the first time that he had given them the tablets, right? With the golden calves. It was proven that they would resort to that if they're not kept in line. So he was warning them of the dangers of impurity. Of letting these things cloud their reasoning and cloud their consciousness. That's what he was warning them of. And then in verse 5, Exodus 20 verse 5. This is still part of the second commandment. It says, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. And so in that verse, I believe he's given them the consequences of impurity. I know that that is a big, big deal in the spiritual realm of generational sins. And he was warning them, if you do that, Guess what your kids are going to do? And guess what their kids are going to do? And the kids' kids are going to do? He's telling them right there that it's going to go into the fourth generation. And if you study their culture over there, they usually on one estate or in one little home there, they would have four generations. And so that's what God was warning them about. You continue this impure lifestyle. You let these types of things infiltrate into your life. And it's not just hurting you and your relationship with me. It's going to hurt your kids and your kids' kids and your kids' kids' kids and on to come. I, I just, I'm, I feel prompted to say this. I, I, back when Becky and I walked through the dark time of our lives and unfaithfulness in our relationship, and uh, I, I remember so well that was the one thing that I said, you know what? I don't want that for my kids. And how in the world am I going to overcome that? And I remember so well, I remember exactly where we knelt. I remember who came over. I, I invited uh, Kenner's dad. I don't know, Kenner's not here. I invited Kenner's dad over and I told him, I said, I don't want this for the generations to come. I'll pay the price for what I've done, but this can't go on. It's got to stop here. And that night, it stopped. It was prayed off of us. And you know what? There's an amazing freedom of knowing that, you know what? It's not going to be handed down to our kids through us. God, he warns us in the second commandment that this would happen. And we have to be very, very intentional. 
of keeping that impurity out of our relationship. God is a jealous God. He wants our full attention. But then in verse 6, he tells us of the blessings of purity. He says it this way, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. That's how he concludes commandment number two. You keep this and I'll show mercy to thousands. And in in Deuteronomy 7 verse 9, it says it this way. Therefore, know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for for a thousand generations. So he, he doesn't just say thousands there. He says for generations to come and come and generations more, there will be love and mercy. Amen? Uh, To finish that verse, with those who love him and keep his commandments. God puts these commandments in place for relationship. And as we walk through every one of these commandments as they're coming up, all the way through 10, we're going to have Mother's Day next week. We've got a couple Sundays that are going to be in between. You will find that these commandments weren't put into place as law as much as they were to help us build our relationship and maintain our relationship with God. It's an awesome thing to see. But the principle for commandment number two is the principle of purity. The first one is priority. The second one is purity. We put God first, and we keep ourselves pure in front of him, and he will bless us. That's a promise from him. He wants to do that for the generations to come. He knew that impurity of any kind is going to affect our relationship with him. He wants us to have a pure relationship with him. I'm going to ask Kurt to come up, the team. If you would come up. As you sit here this morning, as we, as we study these commandments, I, I don't know what God's doing in your heart. I, know, I just know we had a wonderful service last week. If you weren't here, you missed out on an unreal presentation of God's mercy and who he is and his power. Amen. If you were here, I don't know what's on your heart this morning, but I feel like maybe I should open it up just for a few minutes. Maybe you haven't given God priority in your life and you know it and you want to do that publicly. Maybe you want to do that as an accountability factor to all of us that are here. Maybe you've had impure infiltrations, I don't know, in your life. Worshiping something, making a graven image out of something, miscuing the worship to God as the way he had planned it. I don't know. If that's you and you want to talk about it, we'll talk about it this morning. My goal as a pastor here is to see people get a deeper relationship with God. And as we walk through these Ten Commandments, you'll have a lot of chances to to deal with some things. And you know what? Don't walk out of here with your heart pounding. This is church. We're a family. You saw it last Sunday. We have a lot of love here, and there's a lot of unity here, and I thank each and every one of you for that. Don't walk out of here with something on your mind. You guys can stand.